So does everybody speak English? Yeah. Okay, good. First of all, I would like to ask you to sit farther from one another, at least two meters from one another. Please go to the second and third row and separate from one another at least for two meters. That's important. And don't forget about it during other classes. Two meters, at least. So you go farther or at least somewhere this, this way. Leave one row empty. Leave one row empty and go to the third row and row number five, etc. That's very important. And remember why this is important. Because if some of you is infected and you stay close to an, an infected person just for one minute or three minutes, that's nothing, that's not dangerous. But if, if you stay next to the infected person for 15 minutes or 20 minutes or half an hour, that's very dangerous. So avoid standing close to other people for a long time. That's all. Okay. So, <clears throat> my name is Alexei Ilyin. I'm an associate professor of physics here at the Department of General Physics of MIPT. And we will discuss with you some issues of general physics. And the course of general physics will take three years. This is a comprehensive course for three years. That is for six semesters. This is the first semester, and it will be devoted to the introduction to physics, the course of introduction to physics. The next semester, you will have mechanics, and then semester number three will be devoted to thermodynamics and molecular physics. And then semester number four will be electricity and magnetism. And then semester number five, optics. And then finally, quantum physics or atomic physics during the last semester. So in this coming three years, you will have a comprehensive course of physics. And in the end of it, you will be able to answer a question. What physics is all about? What is the essence of physics? What is the core of it? I can give you the answer right away. The physics is about the most fundamental laws of nature. The physics as a science studies the most comprehensive, most fundamental laws of nature. And for this reason, physics is the basics. It's the basic fundamental base for other technical and natural sciences. Physics is very important to understand chemistry and biology and biochemistry and etc. etc. many many natural sciences and also technical sciences such as radio electronics and uh, machine tools etc. etc. So every engineering science, or every natural science, incorporates physics as the basis, because physics provides the basic knowledge of the laws of nature. How will you study physics? Mostly by yourself. Uh, you will have to apply a lot of individual efforts 
in order to study physics. And here in the classroom, we will discuss just some of the issues. It's very important for you to learn how to use your time and efforts to organize your individual work. It's very important. And the main thing you have to learn here, you have to learn how to learn in the most efficient way. So you will work individually, and in order to help you organize your work, I will distribute among you this small booklet, which will help you in your studies Just take this, please. And this one, and yes, this one. And you need two also. And here you've got one, right? And you need one. And this one is for you. So this booklet contains important information for you. On the first page, which is the title page, you can see how many hours you have to work individually. At least five hours every week. This is the minimum required time to learn and understand physics. At least five hours a week. That is approximately one hour a day excluding Sundays. On the second page, you can see the syllabus. The syllabus is the list of questions which you have to learn during this semester. Every question listed here will be included in the final exam. You will have to pass oral exam at the end of this semester. And there, in the exam cards, will be all of these questions. And which one of you you will answer, it's just a matter of random choice. So some of these questions will be your question at the exam. In order to study all these questions, you have to read some literature, recommended literature for you. This is an elementary textbook on physics by Landsberg. Uh, Landsberg is a Russian academician who created this course of physics, a three-volume course of physics. And also you will have to solve some problems in physics contained in the uh, Buchovtsev collection of programs. So these books are mentioned here, they are indicated here. And also some other books for further reading. Where can you get this lit literature? I will send all of you a link to a Google disk where you can find all this material and you can download, it, download these books to your computers. Well, some people are new to this audience. Please come here and take it. Please come here. Three, three of you or two? Just two of you. Okay, take the two booklets. So I will send you a link to a Google disk where you will find all these textbooks in physics and collection of problems in physics. And the books recommended for further reading. You will have all this literature in your computer, actually, after downloading it. And uh, that's quite enough information for you. Uh, on the third page, you can see the problems, the numbers indicating the problems which you have to solve from the Buchovtsev collection of problems. The Buchovtsev is one of the books indicated here, and you will download it to your computer. So all these problems will be available to you, and you could spend 
time every day to solve these problems. About 10 problems every week. By the end of week number six, you will have to solve about 60 problems. And then you will have a mid-semester written test, which is indicated here as test number one. The written test will last for three hours, and there will be five problems. And you will have to solve these problems, and you will get some score. The first score obtained during the course of physics study. And then you will have to present your home assignment consisting of your solutions of all these problems, about 60 problems. The home assignment must be defended, not merely shown to me, but it must be defended, which means that I will ask you questions about the solutions of any problem, and you will have to explain how did you solve this problem. Then during the second half of the semester, you will have to solve another 60 to 70 problems up to the end, and then present or submit home assignment number two and defend it. Those who have chosen to study distantly will make photos of all the solutions and will have to send me these photos electronically. So the procedure will be absolutely the same, but the submission will be electronic submission of the photos of, of the solutions of those students who have chosen a distant study. So at the end of the semester, you will have another written test, which will be a final written exam. Just a second. Take this one for you. Uh, at the end of the semester, you will have a written exam in physics, again, consisting of five problems, and then uh, the oral exam. At the oral exam, you will have to answer one of the theoretical questions indicated in the syllabus, and the second question, which is called a question of student's choice, or simply a question of choice. This is some question which you may choose by yourself just right away, or weeks or months before the exam. You may choose a question for the exam by yourself, a question of your choice. And then during the exam, you will be given 10 minutes to make a presentation of this question using uh, some graphs or some pictures, some material which you have prepared before. And you will, have, you will give such a presentation, like a scientific report, something like that. All this procedure of which I am talking about is presented in a document which is called uh, Standard Guidelines for Students. This document, Standard Guidelines for Students, is posted on the same Google disk to which you will have a link. So you will have the possibility to download this document, Standard Guidelines, and read it, and everything is explained there. What will you study, and what will be the exam, and what questions may be given to you at the exam, and what you are expected to know, and what you are expected to show, what skills you are expected to demonstrate, and what will be the system of assessment of your knowledge, assessment. What will be the system of marks and scores given to you? So everything is, is explained in detail in this file, which, which you will have access to. I will send you the link to all these files today, later today.
And today we have to, to start this introduction to physics course. Uh, I can tell you that Russian students here don't have this introduction to physics course. Why do you have? We have decided to, to make this course of introduction to physics for you because you originated from different countries. And in different countries, they have different programs in physics at school, at high school, at secondary school. So all of you have different level of knowledge in physics and different skills. Some of you know how to solve problems, others don't know how to solve. Most of you don't know how to solve complicated problems of advanced complexity. So advanced level problems. So this course of introduction to physics is designed to help you prepare yourself to study a real course of general physics, which will start the next semester. This is a preparatory course. Russian students don't have such uh, an introduction to, uh, to physics because uh, a program, a physics program at Russian schools is very, very advanced. They, they already know everything they need to know to study at this institute. But, not in, but in other countries, this is not the situation. This is not so. In many countries, the level of physics education is low. So students come here from other countries and they don't know elementary things uh, about physics. And uh, they are not prepared. They are not ready to study a real general physics course. So that's the reason we have introduced uh, this course of introduction to physics. And uh, today we must study a discussion of kinematics. And the first issue is the subject and role of physics. I have already told you what is the role of physics. As physics studies the most fundamental laws of nature, the physics is the basics for other technical and natural sciences. That's, that's the role of physics. Then we read here, limits of applicability of physical laws. Some people believe that the laws of physics are all correct. This is not so. There is no single law in physics which is absolutely correct. No single law is absolute truth. The absolute truth is unknown to us. We don't know everything about nature. And therefore, the laws of physics which we have discovered, the, the mankind has discovered during the hundreds of years of its development, these laws of physics are not absolutely adequate, not always correct. Every law of physics has its domain of applicability, the area in which this law works well. If you go beyond the domain of applicability of physical law, the law will give a mistake, it will become incorrect. For example, the laws of classical mechanics work very well in a laboratory. When the velocities are not very large and the masses of bodies are not very large, but if we consider bodies moving with very high velocities, close to the velocity of light, then the laws of classical mechanics will not work. They will produce incorrect results. And you will have to choose other laws, the laws of relativistic mechanics, which became known just a hundred years ago, just a hundred and ten years ago. And before that, people knew nothing about relativistic mechanics. Now we know relativistic mechanics, and we know how to apply the laws of physics in this domain of high velocities. But that doesn't mean that we know everything. No. Uh, if we take any law of physics, it works well in our laboratory. But our laboratory is very simple case in nature because 
what we have here in, on the surface of our planet Earth, very small gravitational field, very small electric and magnetic fields, small temperature, small pressure. Well, the conditions here are so mild and favorable to us, to living creatures, that we work and live in these conditions and we learn physics laws and discover physics laws applicable in these conditions. But if we go to some other conditions, our laws of physics will not work. They must be changed. But nobody knows exactly how to change them. How will physics laws change if we go to very high gravitational, very strong gravitation field? Or how, how the laws of physics will change if we go to very strong magnetic fields? Or very strong pressure, very high pressure of millions or even billions atmospheres? We don't know. Or very high temperature. We don't really know. We may guess. Yes, we may extrapolate the existing laws. We may try to configure what will happen there in other conditions. But nobody knows exactly. That is why all the laws of physics have limited applicability. And you should always remember about that. If you, if you take any formula in physics, and the laws are represented by formulas, so if you take any formula, you should remember that this formula may be applied only in certain conditions. And if conditions become different, then this formula will not work. It will produce wrong results. This idea is expressed shortly by the words, every physics law has its domain of applicability, limited area of applicability. And if you go beyond this area, the law will, be, will become incorrect. It will produce incorrect results. This fact is, the, uh, is just reflects uh, the obvious thing that we don't yet know everything about nature. Certainly, we don't know everything. We know very little, actually. It's, it seems somebody may, somebody may think that we know practically everything. No, that's not correct. We know very little about nature. And uh, that is why science makes discoveries practically every day. Some physicists in some laboratory discover some new effects in a very low temperature crystals. Other physicists discover new effects in very high temperature plasma, etc., etc. Every day we have new information and new discoveries. Why? Because we still don't know everything about nature. And that is the reason why every physics law has a limited applicability. Well, so we must discuss something about kinematics. Uh, kinematics is the simplest uh, subject in physics, the simplest issue. Uh, and the kinematics describing the motion of bodies, which we may observe, the motion of uh, motor vehicles and the motion of airplanes, the motion of planets, etc., the motion of machine tools. Everything is described by simple kinematics, classical kinematics. And the most simple case in kinematics is the motion of a material point. The motion of a material point. How to study the motion of material point? First of all, we have to understand how to determine the position of material point. What is material point? It's a small body, small object the dimensions of which are smaller than the scope of motion. That's the definition of material point. So anything may be a material point, anything. For example, a car moving along the road for a large distance 
if the scope of motion is larger than the dimensions of the car, then the car may be considered a material point. A planet may be a material point because the radius of the planet orbit around the sun is much greater than the dimension, than the diameter of the planet. The star may be, a star, any star may be a material point if we consider motion of the star inside the galaxy, among other stars. The whole galaxy containing billions and billions of stars may be considered a material point if we consider the motion of this galaxy in the universe as a whole, along with billions of other galaxies. So anything may be considered a material point if the scope of motion is larger than the dimensions of this object. In order to determine the position of material point, we need some reference frame. We need to measure distances. The position may be measured as a distance to other bodies. For example, we have some object here, which we take as the reference frame and which we consider motionless at rest. And then we can measure the distance to this material point. In order to measure the distance x from some, some other object, taken as a reference object. In order to measure distance, what do we have to do? We have to apply a ruler, for example. That is, we have to choose a unit of measurement. A unit of measurement must be chosen to measure all distances. In the international system, the standard unit of measurement for distance is meter. So we take one meter as a unit of measurement, and we have to count how many times this meter is contained in the distance x. And so applying this unit of measurement several times, we may count how many meters are here, and so we may measure the position. That is the principle of measurement of any physical quantity. In order to measure a physical quantity, you have to compare it with the corresponding physical unit. And for each physical quantity, there is a special physical unit which has special definition and which, we, which may be reproduced in a laboratory using special procedure. And this is a great science which studies units of measurements and how to define them and how to reproduce them in a laboratory. And this science is called what? A metrology. Metrology. Have you heard about it? Metrology is a science about the units of measurement and how to measure different physical quantities. So this is a whole science. We will not spend much time discussing it. You may read about it. By the way, when you will study physics, when you will read textbooks, if you find anything unknown to you, any term, any word which you can't understand, what will be your actions? Very simple, just Google it. Just Google it and you will find the explanation of this word in any language, maybe in your own language, if it's easier for you, maybe in English. So, use the internet to find the definitions of and explanations of various words and terminology. Use the internet for this purpose and don't use the internet for purposeless and aimless surfing. This is the waste of time. Learn how to organize your time and don't waste it on aimless surfing through the internet. Okay, so in order to measure distance, we have to choose the unit of measurement and the uh, situation with measurement, with measuring distance is very simple and obvious, but the same is the situation with any other physical quantity. In order to measure any quantity, you have to find the corresponding unit of measurement and the appropriate device 
And to measure physical quantity means to count how many times the unit of measurement is contained in the quantity which you measure. That's it. The principle is the same. So we can measure the coordinate of a material point A, which is the distance OA expressed in meters. Certainly, there are many other units of measurement. Not only meters are used, also centimeters and millimeters and microns and kilometers, etc., etc. Whichever is useful in any particular situation. As far as we know the coordinate of this point, as far as we can measure it, we can measure the change in coordinate. If it changes in time, sometimes it does change. If this point is moving, then its coordinate is changing in time. For example, if this point moves here, then the coordinate will be different. So this was the initial coordinate, and then we will have final coordinate. This initial coordinate happened at, was observed at initial time, and this final coordinate may be observed at some final time t. By definition, the velocity, it's better to say the speed of a material point, is the change in coordinate over the change in time, the time interval and the corresponding change in coordinate occurring in a given, in a certain time interval. That is the definition of the speed of material point. Uh, speed is a scalar quantity, which has, which has only the value. But if the material point moves in, can move in different directions, so this material point A can move here and another material point B can move in a different direction, then we have to use velocity instead of speed. Velocity is a vector quantity. Velocity of material point has not only magnitude, but also the direction. We will discuss vectors a little bit later, but from the very beginning, I stress that the speed is a scalar quantity, while the velocity is a vector quantity. From this formula, it's easy to find the coordinate of material point as a function of time. It will be what? The initial coordinate plus Vt on condition that the initial time was chosen to be zero. If the initial time is zero, which is very convenient, which is natural, then this will be the formula defining the change in coordinate with time. the initial coordinate, the speed of the body, and the time. This is a linear function. If the speed of the body is constant, and this is the simplest case which we consider in the beginning, then this is the linear function, linear with time. There are many other functions, not linear. For example, there are quadratic functions when we have a square, when we have some square here, some maybe a function of the third power of t, maybe a square root of t, anything. A, lo a lot of functions, infinite number of functions. But we consider only the most simple function, the linear function, when the time is just in the first power. It's very convenient to use a 
graphic presentation of a particle motion. A graphic presentation is the graph of particle coordinate x versus time. If this is a initial time zero, then the initial coordinate, which, not, which is not necessarily zero, will be some initial coordinate here, indicated here, at the initial time, which is zero. And then, as time goes on and becomes larger and larger, then the quantity, then the value of this x coordinate is also growing. If the time goes on to the positive values, then the coordinate grows. And at this point of time, the coordinate is larger than it was initially. So this is just the x as a function of time. Such graphic representation is very convenient. And in this graphic representation, we can easily see that in this right triangle, the vertical leg is delta x, which is x minus x zero. And the horizontal leg in this triangle is just time interval t. So if we look at the definition of velocity, which is d delta x over t in our case, if t0 equals 0, then we can easily see that the vertical leg divided by horizontal leg is the velocity. The velocity in this case is just, yes, the vertical leg over horizontal leg. And the opposite leg divided by the adjacent leg is the tangent of this angle alpha. So this is the tangent of alpha. So whenever you see a graph showing the dependence of coordinate as a function of time, and you see some line representing this dependence, you always know that this angle, the tangent of this angle, is the velocity of this particle at this point. This is very convenient. So we hear the bell ringing. Do we need to make an interval, a five minutes interval? No? So we continue? Okay. So, Underlining the most important thing, this one, is the definition. This is the definition of velocity. And everything written and shown on the graphs is just the consequence of this definition, of this formula. So if you remember this formula and work with this, you can easily obtain everything. The most important is the definition. Uh, when you study physics, by the way, uh, during this semester, you must use two thick notebooks. The next semester you will have three thick, thick notebooks, but this semester only two. And uh, let me show you. So this is a kind of thick notebook. Kind of thick notebook. You must have two such notebooks. The first one, to make notes during lectures and to make notes when you study physics textbooks at home. So the first notebook for theoretical studies. You must write down all the formulas, all the definitions like this one, and there will be a lot of definitions in our course. You must write down all the derivations and all the explanations concerning theoretical results 
in this theoretical thick notebook. Another thick notebook must be used, used to write down the solutions of your home assignment. What you, will, what you will do at home. You will solve these problems. Some of these problems we will solve here. We will consider the solution here. We will discuss in order, in order to teach you how to solve problems. We will discuss some of the solutions, but not all of them. Not all of them. Uh, all of the solutions you must uh, produce by yourself and to write down the solutions in another thick notebook number two, which is a notebook for home assignments. That, that is. That's it. Uh, so during this semester, you must have two thick notebooks, each one of you. Next semester, you will also use similar thick notebooks, but you will also have laboratory in physics. Another subject in general physics. You will attend uh, physical laboratories and you will uh, make some laboratory works. And so you will need another thick notebook number three, the next semester, for laboratory works. That's it. So that was the first definition in our course of physics. And now the second definition. The second definition is acceleration of a particle. Many objects move with very high velocity. And the velocity changes in time. That's natural. We observe such things all the time, every day. So the change in velocity may be designated as delta v. And if we divide the change in velocity by the time interval during which this change occurred, then such quantity is called acceleration. And this is the definition of acceleration. This is the definition, the second important definition. This formula may also be written similarly to what we have already seen. This may be written as the velocity at time t minus the initial velocity divided by the current time minus the initial time. And uh, if initial time is chosen to be 0, then we have v minus v0 over t. And from this formula, we can easily obtain the velocity as a function of time, this velocity as a function of time, that will be the initial velocity v0 plus a t. So this is the consequence of a definition of acceleration. Again, it's very useful to show some functions on the graph. And we use the graph of velocity versus time, velocity as a function of time. And if this is a initial time, which is 0, then the initial velocity, v0, is some quantity here, the initial velocity at the initial moment of time. And then, as time goes to infinity, as time grows, always the case, then the velocity also becomes larger and larger. And at this moment of time, we have this velocity as a function of time. And v of t is larger than v0 if this coefficient is positive. If a is positive, then the velocity at this moment of time will be larger than the velocity at the initial 
moment of time. This is not always the case. Sometimes the acceleration A may be negative. If it's negative, then the graph of function will be different. It will go down. So this graph is for acceleration larger than zero, positive acceleration, and such curve and such function will be for negative accelerations. As the time grows, the velocity will diminish. And if acceleration is zero, then this coefficient is zero, then time goes on and on, but this is always zero. So if acceleration is zero, the velocity remains the same. It remains constant. The velocity is always the same as the initial velocity. It's constant for zero acceleration, if acceleration is zero. Again, on this graph, we can easily see that this segment equals v of t minus v0. And this segment is t. So the definition of acceleration is the result of division of delta v by t and result of division of delta v by t geometrically means that we divide the opposite leg by the adjacent leg and that will be the tangent of this angle. This may be a different angle, not necessarily alpha. Let's use another like beta, another character. So geometrically it's obvious that the acceleration which is delta v by delta t, by definition, is tangent beta, tangent of this angle. Tangent, by definition, is the opposite leg divided by the adjacent leg. Hmm? What? What? The tangent, by definition, mm -hmm. is the opposite leg in the right triangle, the leg opposite to the given angle, divided by the adjacent leg. So the right triangle has two legs. One leg is opposite to the angle, and another leg is adjacent to the angle. So by definition, if you take the opposite leg and divide it by the adjacent leg, you will have tangent, you will obtain tangent of this angle, by definition of tangent. There is no science in this formula. This is just the definition, what tangent is. Just the definition. Any other questions? This graph showing the dependence of velocity versus time is so important that I will draw it again in order to point out to some interesting consequences. So along the vertical axis, we show the velocity as a function of time. And along the horizontal axis, we show time. And this is the origin of coordinates, which is zero velocity with zero time. If at the original, at the initial time, the velocity is not zero, then it's something different from zero, some initial velocity, v zero. So I repeat everything which we had here, and I show again the graph 
showing the dependence of velocity versus time. If this is a straight line, if this is a straight line, then the motion is called uniformly accelerated motion. Uniformly accelerated, <coughs> a uniform <coughs> acceleration. That means that the acceleration is constant. It's larger than the zero, acceleration is positive and constant. Then we will have the straight line. At the initial moment of time, we have the initial velocity. At some other moment of time t, we have larger velocity. Larger according to this formula. If the acceleration is zero, then that will be a uniform motion with constant velocity, and it will be represented by horizontal line on this graph. The horizontal line here shows the motion with constant velocity and zero acceleration. It's easy to note that if we take the initial velocity v0 and multiply it by time interval t, then we obtain the area of this rectangle. The area of this rectangle so becomes v0 times t. v0 times t, velocity multiplied by time, is the displacement of the body if the initial coordinate was 0. If the initial coordinate 0, then velocity multiplied by time interval is the displacement of the body, or the path covered by this point. So this area is equal to the displacement of the material point during time interval t if the material point was moving at constant velocity v0. In case the material point moves with varying velocity, with some acceleration, and the velocity changes in time, then it's easy to understand that the distance covered by material point during some time interval delta t will be equal to the area under this figure, which is a trapezoid. The distance covered by a material point moving with acceleration is also equal to the area of this figure under the curve, under the graph showing the dependence of velocity versus time. Why so? Because if we consider the time interval to be less and less and infinitely small, then this trapezoid, trapezoid will become very, very thin, and the difference between these two velocities will be negligible. That will, this point will go closer to this point, and so the difference between these two points will be negligible. And so the velocity will be almost constant. And for constant velocity, we have already understood that for constant velocity, the area under this line is the displacement. So for this case, when the velocity is almost constant, then the area under this line is also the, the displacement. For this reason, if we divide this area into many, many small intervals and many, many small figures, very thin, uh, each, each figure is a very thin 
a trapezoid, then the area of this figure will be the displacement of the material point during this small time interval. And so the displacement of the material point during the whole time interval t will be the area of this triangle. That will be the displacement of uniformly accelerated material point. And the area of triangle, of this right triangle, can easily be calculated. You know how to calculate the area of the right triangle. This, you must take one leg, which is delta V, and you must multiply by another leg, which is T, and divide by 2. That will be the area, say, delta S, of this right triangle. And we have already understood that the area under this curve equals the displacement of the material particle. So if the material particle moves according to this law, then the displacement, total displacement of material particle which had some initial velocity which changes in time according to this function, the velocity increases with time increases according to this formula. The larger the time, the larger this term, and so the velocity becomes larger and larger with time. And this is shown by this figure. So in this particular case, the distance covered by this particle will be equal to the distance covered if the particle moved at constant velocity plus the distance delta s owing to acceleration, owing to the change of velocity. So that will be V zero times T plus delta S, which is this formula. That is delta V T over two. I continue the, this formula here. Delta V is just V minus V0. So if we substitute V minus V0 here, What we finally obtain V zero T plus V T. minus V zero T over two. That will give us 2 V0T minus V0T. That will be just V0T plus VT over 2.
If you look at this formula, V is proportional to AT. And if we substitute here AT, we will obtain V0T plus AT squared over 2. Remember that this area was calculated as the area of this triangle, which, uh, which means that we supposed, by calcula when calculating this area, we supposed that initial velocity is zero. We just like looked at this graph with horizontal line here. That was the zero initial velocity for this case. So the distance covered by a material particle in the uniformly accelerated motion is V0t, the initial velocity times t plus acceleration t squared over 2. That's another important consequence of the definition of acceleration. If the, initial con if the initial velocity is zero, then then the distance will be just proportional to a t squared acceleration times squared over two. And in this case, the distance as a function of time will give will be given by a parabolic function a t squared over 2. And this parabolic function looks like this, looks like such a curve, a parabola. Distance is proportional to time interval squared. The greater the time interval, the greater will be the impact of this term. So the graph of this function is not a straight line, it's a parabola. And this is the initial time zero. So at some moment of time t1, the material point will cover distance d1. At some other point in time, t2, the material point will be at this distance d2 from, from the zero. And if I want to find the displacement of this material point during time interval from t1 to, to, to t2 during this time interval, then this displacement will be given by this section. And let's call it, well, L to use a new character. So L will be equal to d2 minus d1. And that will be a t sub 2 squared over 2 minus a t sub 1 squared over 2. And now let me multiply and divide each term by a. I multiply the first term by a and divide by a, nothing changes. So I will have a squared t squared t sub 2 squared over 2a. Nothing changed here. Minus the same trick with the, sa with the second term, a squared t squared over 2 over 2a. 
And what is A times T? A times T. We know A times T is the velocity in case the initial velocity is 0. If the initial velocity V0 V0 is omitted here, then A times T acceleration times time interval is just the velocity. So what we have here in the denominator of this term is the velocity 2 squared over 2A minus velocity 1 squared over 2A. That gives us another interesting formula which is the displacement of a material particle uniformly accelerated if the final velocity is v sub 2 and initial velocity was v sub 1 and the acceleration was a. Then the displacement is given by this formula. If we know the initial velocity of a moving body and the final velocity and we know that the mo motion was uniformly accelerated with constant acceleration, then this formula gives you the displacement of this body. Where did we get this formula from? How did we arrive at this formula? How did we derive it? Only from the definition of acceleration. We started from here and using simple considerations and very simple manipulation, algebraic transformations, we arrived at this interesting result. Well, such is the way of obtaining formulas in kinematics. You take the definition of velocity and consider some algebraic transformations. And you obtain some formulas and some graphs. Also, you take the definition of acceleration. And after some algebraic transformations, you obtain many different formulas. Not only this one. There are many other formulas. For example, suppose the initial velocity is 0. Then final velocity can be obtained from this formula as square root of 2AD. Another formula, well-known formula. If you know the distance covered by the material point and you know its acceleration and you know that the initial velocity was 0, then you can calculate the final velocity. Again, we used some algebraic transformation and very simple uh, manipulations, and we obtained a new formula. So in this way, you can obtain a lot of formulas describing uh, kinematics, kinematics of a material point. I have shown you just a few. How can you obtain these formulas? What was important? Important again, again, important is the definition of physical quantity, the definition of velocity, and the definition of acceleration. So this is the most important thing. If you know the definition and you know simple algebra, you can obtain any formula. You can derive it. Or you can at least understand where does this formula emerge from, where does it come from. Also, it's very important to understand the graphs, the dependence of coordinate versus time, and the dependence of velocity versus time. And uh, as the graphs of motion are very important, I will discuss it a little bit more. I will give you a little, a little bit more discussion on this, on this topic. So let's consider some motion. where the coordinate of a particle is a function of time 
and the function of time is this. At the initial moment of time, when time is zero, at the initial moment, the particle was here. That was the initial coordinate. Then the particle was at rest, and then it started to move in such a way that its coordinate diminished and returned to zero at some moment of time. And then the motion continued. And then the particle changed the direction of motion and moved here. For example, let's consider such a motion, such a graph of dependence of particle velocity, of particle coordinate versus time. What will be the dependence of particle velocity versus time in this case? This is the zero velocity. Initially, the particle was here. And as time went on, the coordinate remained the same. It means that the velocity is zero. The velocity is zero until this moment of time. That's quite natural, because the velocity is the tangent. Uh, the velocity is the tangent of this angle of inclination of the curve x versus t. So the angle of, angle of this line is 0. It's horizontal. It's parallel to the horizontal t-axis. So the tangent of this angle of inclination is 0. And so the velocity here is 0 during this time interval. And then the material point started to move backward so that this angle is negative, and the tangent of this angle is negative. And so the velocity will be negative up to this point. And then the material point started to move in such a way that its coordinate increased with time. It was negative at some moment of time, at this moment. The coordinate was negative, it was less than zero, and then it increased and became zero. So this movement of particle certainly is described by a positive velocity. So the velocity will be some positive value. We'll have some positive value. So the velocity graph will be depicted by such a step-like function. Now suppose that the velocity changes not immediately, but suppose that it takes some time for a particle to change its velocity, so that this is not, not the angle, but a curve. And here, again, we have some curve. This is actually the case, always. Uh, the particle, in reality, cannot change its velocity immediately, just in a zero time. It takes time to change the velocity, always. The velocity cannot change immediately. So the same will be here. The velocity will not change immediately. It will go something like that. And that w then what will be the acceleration as a function of time? acceleration of this particle. When the velocity is constant here, the acceleration is zero. But then the particle started to accelerate in negative direction, and the acceleration here will become very large negative acceleration. Then the particle velocity again is constant, and the acceleration is zero here. And here the particle accelerates and acquires positive velocity, so the acceleration will be large positive, will have large positive value at this point. And then again, as the velocity is constant, the acceleration will remain zero. So, such are the graphs 
describing the particle motion. You can imagine all sorts of motions with different accelerations, different velocities, how they change. You can imagine all sorts of motions. But you must be able always to show the motion of a particle on such graphs. How the velocity depends on the change of coordinate and how the acceleration depends on the change of velocity. You must be able to draw such graphs for any motion of a point particle. Does it seem to be very difficult? Is it understandable? Okay. In the textbooks, which you will read and study at home, all this situation is explained in detail. So if you don't understand now everything, please open the textbooks at home and spend some hours to study this subject. Uh, we have to study kinematics during the first week of this semester. And during this first week, according to the uh, syllabus and schedule of your studies, you have to spend at least five hours of individual work to repeat all these things and to study and to try to derive the formulas and to understand the graphs at least five hours and to solve the problems which are here for kinematics. So if you don't understand anything during lecture, please ask questions. But even if you don't ask questions, when you come home, open the textbook and read it and study it and take notes and make notes in your notebook and try to understand it's everything explained. Everything is explained in the textbook and the explanation is very good. Сколько у нас времени? А, six minutes, okay, good. Uh, during the remaining six minutes, I wanted to discuss with you a solution of one problem, a very simple problem. A problem from Buchovcev. from your collection of problems, which you will use during this semester. The problem on kinematics of uniform motion. The kinematics of uniform motion with constant speed. So we will use this formula to solve the problem. And the statement of the problem, I will just read it to you, as you don't have this book now with you. <clears throat> I will read it to you and uh, I will try to show everything happening on a picture. So, this is the statement of the problem. A motorboat traveling upstream of the river met a raft flowing downstream. So there is a river. A river flows in this direction. Water flows in this direction. And the motorboat, so let it be a coordinate x, which is positive in the direction of a river flow. And the motorboat travels upstream, so the motorboat goes upstream against the, the river flow. And the motorboat meets a raft, a raft which is on the surface of the water, which flows, which goes along uh, together with the river flow. So at some point they meet the raft and the motorboat. One hour after this, 
The engine of the motorboat stalled. It was broken. It took half an hour to repair it. And during this time, the boat freely floated downstream. That is, the boat went down with the velocity of the river stream during half an hour. When the engine was repaired, the boat traveled downstream. So the first the boat went up, then for half an hour, for 30 minutes, they repaired the engine and the boat was floating down. And then the boat, and then the boat with the engine, with the same engine, went downstream with the same velocity with respect to water surface. When the engine was repaired, the boat traveled downstream with the same speed relative to the current as before and overtook the rafts at a distance, at a distance as equal 7.5 kilometers from the original point where they met from the point where they had met the first time. Determine the velocity of the river current, considering it constant. Determine the velocity of the river flow. Very simple. The boat moves with constant velocity, and then the engine is broken, and it takes for 30 minutes at rest with respect to the water surface of the river. So it's dragged by this river stream. And the raft doesn't move with respect to the water surface. It's at rest with respect to, because it has no engine. The raft has no engine. It flows down at the velocity of the river flow. And then the boat made a U-turn and went in, in opposite direction to, to chase the raft. And it overtook the raft at 7.5 kilometers down the river flow. Determined the velocity of the river. That was the bell, the end of our lecture. So I would ask you to solve this problem at home. This is very simple. It must use only this formula, nothing more. The formula for uniform motion with constant velocity. Who is moving? The motorboat is moving first upstream and then downstream. And the river, water, water in river flows down at, this, at some constant velocity, which you must find based on the statement of the problem. That's it. Let it be the end of our first lecture. Thank you.